Uh, so we're going to get started. So if everyone in the room would take a seat. Um, my colleagues and I are going to spend about an hour and a half, and we're going to be talking about the Sustainable Development Goals ICT playbook. And let me tell you a little bit about what motivated the development of this playbook. If you look at what's happened over the past 15 years, the world's made great progress in improving the um, human condition. Um, but we don't feel that we're really leveraging technology um, to the extent that we can in order um, um, to really, you know, take that last 100, 800 million people that live in extreme poverty and, and um, you know, give them access to the things that will make their, their life better. Um, so we have work to do um, still, and we think technology can be a strategic enabler of that work. If you look at the use of technology, there's tremendous potential, you know, to bridge, um, you know, economic and social gaps, to give people a voice, um, to connect them to information and, and services that empower them um, to improve um, um, their livelihoods. There are just many, many um, opportunities. Um, so um, Intel, NetHope, um, Catholic Relief Services, Microsoft, and CDW um, actually sponsored the development of a guide that's really meant to be a practical resource um, for organizations, whether they be governmental organizations, um, INGOs, NGOs, um, um, or technology companies um, um, to look at how the use of ICT can enhance their contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I want to give a special um, thanks to those sponsors. I'd also like to give a special thanks to someone who's not here today. That's um, Lisa Ob Obradovich, um, a global program manager from um, NetHope. Um, she's having her first child, <laughs> um, but she led the project to develop um, um, the guide, and hopefully she is online. I think she is listening to us as we talk about it today. Um, I'd also um, like to introduce our, our panel here um, 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 today, and um, I think um, first I'll introduce Lauren, who needs no introduction, because <laughs> um, you all know um, by this point in the conference who she is <laughs> and <laughs> where she came from. Um, but we also have um, um, Philippa um, Briggs with us here today. She's um, a coordinator um, for um, um, the International um, Telecommunications Union, um, the, the Broadband Commission for Digital. Um, 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 development within that organization. And a lot of you I know are, are familiar with the great work that the ITU is doing um, in this space. Um, we also have with us um, Kate um, Krukiel, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and she's a partnership advisor um, with um, Microsoft's worldwide public sector. And um, she's a technology advisor for partnerships um, for the United Nations um, International Organizations, and she focuses on developing um, key strategic um, um, objectives, mission-related um, um, partnerships, so we're grateful to have her today um, um, with us. Um, we also have Charles Brigham. He's the ESRI account manager um, um, for the nonprofits and global um, organization. And actually, Charles um, came to Esri from um, the World Bank, where he focused on social accountability, open data, and enhancing the bank's, the bank's ability to um, share information that's so critical um, um, for development. And then finally, we have Jim Daniels, who's the COO of Oxfam America. And, um, and um, he, um, he actually joined Oxfam in um, 2009 to help realize um, the vision of the next generation in geo. And so we're very fortunate to have him um, with us um, today. He has a background in global strategy um, um, as well. And um, I'm, by the way, I'm Carol Bothwell. Um, I'm the former CIO of Catholic Relief Services. I'm semi-retired. I, I think I'm going to have to stop saying that. <laughs> you know. But I feel very privileged to have been able to work on this um, SDG ICT playbook. And I must also thank the people that contributed to the playbook. Some of them are in the room here. Um, some of them um, are not with us today. But we have more than 50 um, thought leaders from many different organizations. Um, 
um, um, sector um, help us um, with this playbook, um, you know, give us um, 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 their um, points of view on what's happening with um, the use of um, technology and development. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to spend a few more minutes introducing um, the playbook, and then we're going to ask each of the panel members to talk about um, how they see their organization contributing to the sustainable development goals and how they see the use of um, information and communications technology really enabling um, um, them um, to accelerate um, um, those contributions. And after that, um, what we're going to do is ask the audience to give us some feedback, um, share your ideas with us, and um, you know, share your thoughts about how we can make this resource more valuable um, um, to the organizations that you all um, represent. So now if I can find my clicker. Okay, here we go. So how many of you, um, how many of you have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals? Is there anyone in the room who is not? <laughs> Most of you. Um, uh, anyway, the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, they really represent a shared um, commitment by all the members of um, 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 the UN and uh, leaders around the world to really improve the, um, um, the, um, the human condition. And they really build on a commitment that was um, first expre um, expressed in um, the Millennium Declaration, and they build on the MDGs, um, you know, the 15-year goals um, um, for really ending extreme poverty. And quite frankly, in the last 15 years, there, been, there has been tremendous progress, and we should always keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> because when we look at you know, some of the challenges we've seen today in front of us, we do have to remember that we have made um, um, great progress. Um, yet there's still 800 million people that live um, in extreme um, poverty. And there are um, you know, differences um, both within countries and between countries in what um, we've been able um, to achieve. So we have more work to do. And the thing about the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think is pretty exciting, is that they, they look at the issue of um, development holistically. They, they, they look at economic and social and environmental development um, if we're going to sustain that development as they're really being linked. And, and, and so, you know, they look at all the things that have to happen either to really a, a, a achieve a world um, where we have eliminated poverty, where we have justice um, um, for all people, where all people have dignity, all people um, um, can really realize um, their full potential. And on a planet that will be there and able to sustain us both now and in future you know, generations. Um, so that holistic view of the SDGs is really important. I think the other thing that's exciting about them is that they really realize that to really achieve this vision, it means that um, there has to be a real partnership um, um, between um, um, the, the, the public, the private sector, between governments, between um, um, businesses um, and between civil society organizations to make that happen, that it won't happen without um, um, the collaboration of those organizations. Um, the playbook itself, um, what, it, um, what it says is, well, if you're doing work that is, that is um, related to development, um, that you probably in the next 15 years are going to have to make changes in the way you work if we're really going to move forward. Um, we can't do business as usual and hope to, you know, accomplish um, that, uh, that new world where we have, you know, um, um, opportunity and, and, and justice for all people. Um, and, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals, if you look at them, they won't surprise you because anybody who's been doing development-related work, you will see your work there. So, you know, whether you... So even though they're, they're, these goals, you know, have, have, have been announced, they will look familiar to the, them. They're already goals that you've been trying to achieve in the work um, that you've been doing for um, the past few years. Um, so if, if, if we really have to change the way we work in order to achieve um, uh, the goals, I think we can think of technology as being a strategic enabler of that change, and that's the premise of in the playbook. You know, if you want to achieve the goals, you have to look at the work you do, how it's related to those goals. You have to look at how that work needs to change. 
and you know how um, 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 technology can enable those kind of um, um, changes. So the the hope for the playbook is that it will give you the kind of information that needs to get you started in thinking about that and figuring out, you know, um, what kind of investments um, you need to make um, in um, technology. The goal starts. Uh, the book starts. Um, you know, when we put it together, starts by looking at the SDGs. It says, okay, how does development work relate to those SDGs if we're going to accomplish them, them um, within each of those sectors of development need? Uh, um, in each of those sectors of development, what are the information needs, um, you know, um, and communication needs? And then, you know, how does technology enable those needs? Now, there's been a lot of work that's been done in that area. There have been a lot of um, interesting reports that have come out from the United Nations, from the World Bank, um, you know, from other organizations on um, the applications of technology um, that are related um, 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 to these um, goals. What the playbook tries to do is go a step forward and say, if you look at all those applications that are emerging, all those ICT solutions um, that help you do, um, you know, um, 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 development related work more effectively, what are the key underlying technologies, the building blocks for those solutions that you need to think about when you're putting together um, your um, ICT investment plans? And um, if, those, if those are correct, um, then, um, you know, what are the challenges in implementing those um, technologies? You know, what are the trends um, that might either be exasperating those challenges or, or mitigating those challenges. Um, you, you know, what are um, the methods and, and, and partnerships that will be um, critical um, for overcoming them? And that's what the playbook um, attempts to do. So um, the playbook um, really looks at, um, if I can get this to go here, uh, really looks at um, very broadly at um, three um, major um, ways in, in which technology can be used for the sustainable um, development goals. And the first has to do with really um, enhancing our capability to understand what we're doing, to measure what's happening, to understand whether we're moving towards achievement of those, those goals, what's working, what's not working, um, so that we can really continually adjust and refine what we're doing so we really get um, to that um, 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 state um, faster than we would otherwise. Um, the second thing technology does, it provides tremendous opportunities to increase um, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the work we do. So if you're a development organization, for example, you know, technology really can help you um, with fewer resources, um, you know, do, do more with the resources you have. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Um, you know, technology really can um, make um, your, 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 your work um, um, more effective. The, 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 the third area, and I think this is actually the most exciting area in the use of technology, is technology gives us um, a way to empower people with access to um, services and information that really help them, um, you know, um, advance um, um, themselves. So a lot of what we um, do in development um, um, can enable, facilitate the introduction of um, valuable um, information and services into communities that they take and they, and, and they run with and do new things with, things that we can't yet um, imagine today. Um, so the playbook tries to look at those um, three um, dimensions of um, the use of ICT. Um, the particular building blocks, um, based on all of um, the discussions we've had with um, thought leaders that we think are really important at this point in time, um, are up here on this page. They start with power, talk about um, mobile devices, um, connectivity, cloud computing, um, the Internet of Things, analytics, 3D printing, social media, digital systems, uh, digital services, I'm sorry, smart systems. Um, 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 and in the Internet of Things, we also talk about um, satellites and the use of um, um, UAVs. We think these are key technologies today. Some of them are technologies that are already are really making um, their way in, in, into the developing world in a big way. Other of them, we think over the next 
15 years are going to be extremely in, important. So they're in different stages um, in, in terms of um, um, the challenges that you have to overcome to, 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 to really take advantage of them in a development context. Um, but we, um, we, we think these are important. Now, there, 15 years is a long time. There may be other things that emerge you know, um, 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 during that time, but this is a good starting place, we think, um, um, to think about um, ICT investments you know, for um, your organizations. Um, so the playbook um, will delves into each of those um, areas of technology, and then it also takes those areas and relates them um, to um, 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 the development sector. So it does look at um, within each development sector, you know, um, um, how um, they're being applied today. Now, they, it's not an exhaustive list of how they're applying. Um, it gives you a sense of um, um, how they're beginning to show value in those um, development sectors. So that um, is a brief introduction um, um, to the playbook. You do have a card on your chairs um, that um, gives you the URL. You can download it from the NetHope um, Solution Center. Um, you can also order um, a copy if you want a hard copy of it. I actually think the online version is a little bit neater because it's easy to navigate and it's certainly easy to um, carry around. Um, but with that introduction, what I'd like now to do is turn it over to Lauren and she can talk to us a little bit about her point of view as CEO of NetHope. Thanks, Carol. Uh, are we using slides or are we not using slides? Um, I can see it on my screen. Here we go. Sorry. There you go. There we go. No worries. Um, yeah. Helps me remember what I thought of so brilliantly when I put the slide together. Um, so the question that Carol um, asked us to address was, um, as we think about the SDGs and ICTs, what what role, especially from a NetHope perspective, do we think NetHope ought to be playing? And obviously my colleagues will have different perspectives from um, where they are. And, um, you know, we took a, 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 a moment to reflect on that um, a little bit. And I wanted to speak to each of these, each of these points um, and provide a little color. So the first thing I said was, is one, we are really focused on the impact that technology will have. Um, as Carol said, there's lots and lots of different technologies that could potentially apply to each one of these issues. And some will be more relevant than others. And, and as you go through the guide, you'll see that um, th there's, a, there's a pretty good breakdown as to what, which technologies have the most obvious impact on different development sectors. But there's certainly opportunities for many different technologies. And as technology continues to evolve, for that to change over time. So I think if, from a NetHope perspective, really looking at what that impact is, whether it is a mobile phone or data um, or a really nifty pen with a 10 gigabyte USB key on the end of it, what, what is that going to help us do in terms of solving problems around um, hunger or poverty or health or whatever? Specifically, when we look at NetHope, I think there's this notion of accelerating by example. And for folks that were, were here when, when we were talking about the, the way that we are approaching program development um, inside NetHope and, and opportunities for um, lots of people to come together to, um, to work on a, on, a, on a particular challenge, um, I think this notion of accelerating by example is really important. It is hard sometimes to take a risk. Um, it is especially hard for organizations who, you know, really it is critical for um, you to protect your brands it is really critical to keep donors happy. Um, no one wants to go back to a donor and say, gosh, we tried this thing and it really didn't work, but gosh, we learned a ton. Um, you know, sometimes donors embrace that and sometimes they don't. Um, and so how do we actually work together to say, let's put lots of smart people together. Let's think about the problem. People will have different ideas around what will work and what will not work. And then collectively, let's go out and, and try things. And if it works, then we've moved the ball forward, and we should share that across the broad NetHope and, frankly, the broad sector sector um, sector uh, stakeholders, so that those working approaches can be replicated. And that's one way I think that NetHope is really um, can particularly bring the, uh, things to the table to to accelerate the work around the SDGs. Um, the second is to advocate for an enabling environment. Um, 
whether it's more connectivity, um, whether it's more clarity around the way that we have to treat data, um, whether it is um, making sure that uh, we are advocating for technologies to be able to um, interoperate or exchange information with one another, or we um, do the hard work as a membership to talk about data architectures where we could share data across the membership. All of those things make us all better um, together. And a big part of, I think, what NetHope needs to do is to look at what our member organizations are doing, look at the trends that are happening inside the industry, and then think about what are the things that need to be in place, and where can we bring um, pressure to bear in order to make sure that that enabling environment is right so that our members and our partners um, can be successful in reaching their respective missions. And then the last thing I'll say is we have a real responsibility from a NetHope perspective to shine a bright light on things that work. Things that work, um, things that are gaining traction, things that are getting to scale, things that um, could help other organizations be better, that could help organizations adapt um, or learn from the work um, that is happening either inside NetHope itself or um, inside our member organizations. We have a responsibility to shine a bright light on those things and say, what can we learn from this? And how can we all collectively get better um, as, we, as we try and bring the power of technology um, against the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals. We're, we're now going to ask Maria Fred to talk us a little bit about um, the perspective from the ITU, who's really been focused for a, a long time on moving, on a long time, and moving um, 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 the use of um, technology forward in, in the developing world. Thank you very much, and uh, I just want to say what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be here with you today. Um, many of you, or at least some of you, I hope, <laughs> are familiar with ITU's work. Um, we're 150 years old this year, uh, which um, is quite an achievement for a tech-related <laughs> um, agency. Obviously, we were founded with uh, telegraphy, but have moved on. Um, so, <laughs> um, the ITU is engaged in uh, a number of different areas of work, particularly in relation to ICTs. Um, the Development Bureau, the BDT, uh, typically plans and funds technical assistance projects in developing countries, and uh, historically we have done a lot of work with member state governments um, to help f spread their telecom networks to more rural and remote areas. Uh, the two standardization bureaus, um, the Telecommunications Standardization Bureau for, for Fixed Wireline and the Radio Communication Bureau for Wireless, although obviously those boundaries are blurring, uh, issue quite technical standards for fixed and wireless and most notably, um, there was the IMT 2020 or 5G standards that were approved last week at the Radio Communications Assembly in Geneva. Uh, the World Radio Communications Conference opened yesterday um, to agree the spectrum allocations going forward, um, including for the use of balloons, drones, <laughs> um, sky-fi. <laughs> There's... Um, Google and uh, Facebook lobbying hard for uh, spectrum allocations for those more innovative uses. Um, but I would also mention the work of the Telecommunications Standardization Bureau on GDOT Fast, which is aimed at getting fiber-like speeds out of copper. The idea here being that you don't have to write off the last 80 years of investment in copper lines and that we can still make use of the world's 770 million um, far, uh, fixed lines to deliver modern uh, internet access speeds. So that is very encouraging and very exciting. We're very pleased about that. We also do a lot of advocacy and policy guidance, and here I'll mention the annual Global Symposium for Regulators and our regulatory survey, which has tracked the rise of competition and uh, regulatory agencies worldwide for the last uh, 15 years. There's now 164 regulators, um, more ministries, obviously. <laughs> it's not, a, um, not all 
countries have and or should embrace independent regulation. Um, we also note 148 countries have national broadband plans or strategies in place. So we are seeing a, a lot of good growth in the policy environment. Many more governments are realizing that they need to um, introduce broadband effectively in order to progress and develop their economies and integrate into the global economy. Um, and then more recently, the UN Broadband Commission uh, promotes the use of broadband for the Millennium Development Goals and SDGs um, and publishes its annual State of Broadband report. In terms of monitoring and measurement, <coughs> ITU has provided global ICT stats for the MDGs and will be responsible for the SDGs with the goals obviously were approved this September, but the targets are still coming and they're expected to be confirmed in March 2016. Uh, a lot of mention was made of the era of big data, um, but there are still some pretty big uncertainties. So for example, IT records 7.1 billion mobile subscriptions worldwide, but many of those, or at least some of them, <laughs> are multiple SIM cards. So we think that the unique number of mobile users is somewhere nearer 5 billion, um, but that varies depending on who you ask, and certainly the governments don't know. Um, nowadays, some um, certain private sector players might know, <laughs> um, but they, they may or may not be willing to share that information. Um, so there is still a, a huge amount of work to be done on um, getting the better data that was mentioned um, and th there's a, a lot more information that could be useful out there. Um, personally, uh, as, as a statistician, I, I'm not necessarily in favour of more data per se. I think it's the, the um, it's the most of the work of any master's thesis is in framing the right questions to be able to unpick the data you've got. <laughs> and um, it's this more kind of relevant data that would be um, interesting, but you know, how do you know what's relevant? That, that's a, a major question in itself. So mm -hmm. um, there are some sort of difficulties. Um, there is a bit of a UN love affair with monitoring and measurement. <laughs> whereas, um, as they always used to tell me in my economics masters, the minute you make something a target, uh, the measurement changes. <laughs> um, so, um, and then also, of course, the human behavior around it changes. Um, as soon as you start monitoring something, uh, as soon as you start measuring or tracking something, the human behavior around it can change quite significantly. So I definitely welcome um, NetHope's work and insights, and certainly the playbook is a very useful contribution to um, a very helpful index of some of the questions and um, facts that you might need to consider when actually trying to use technology, which seems to be the holy grail of everybody here. So um, certainly in that respect, I think it's a very uh, useful addition to the conversation. Um, one quick question for you before we go on. Um, do, you, do, you, do you see um, more use of technology to actually do the measurement and analysis in this next 15 years than in the past 15 years? Um, so? Do you think it'll, technology will help you do that more effectively or efficiently? It, it will certainly help collect data and um, depending on who you ask, um, for example, if you were to ask UN Global Pulse, um, that, that has been set up to further that use. But in terms of the conclusions you derive from the data, um, you know, a huge number of uh, discoveries are come from gut instinct. And um, the use of big data, it, sometimes it's getting very, very difficult to distinguish the signal from the white noise. Twitter, for me, was never as good as, as it was in 2009 when I was uh, following about 100 people interested in broadband, um, and I was able to benefit from results of all their surfing and research and ideas. As soon as the hashtag broadband became more widely used, it filled up with people complaining about their broadband service. <laughs> and its uh, value to me as a research tool diminished rapidly. 
So um, to me, it's not just a case of big data, it's better data, and it's better use of those data, and, and that's where I think your playbook is, is really helpful. Thank you. Um, Senator, we're gonna pass it on to Kate. I probably should have asked you to sit in a different order, so. It's okay, makes it exciting. Yep. So for Microsoft, um, we see this as a really big opportunity. And like the gentleman from Vodafone said earlier, um, as you probably know, we are 120,000 people and we have over 800 offices around the globe. Um, and we have some incredibly robust programs already in place, like our citizenship program that you're very well aware of. We've got one of the most innovative carbon neutral programs um, across the board that we, in 2013, became one of the first organizations, technology organizations, to become carbon neutral, not only from our data centers, but from our supply chain and from my, our people. So me flying here, my boss gets a charge for me getting on that plane. My boss gets a charge for me printing out this piece of paper. And we have one of the lowest carbon fees of any of the organizations. So what we kind of looked at is, you know, on September 25th, and if people don't know what that date was, that was the date the, the goals were announced, is across Microsoft there was excitement from, we had 42 countries across the globe that um, showcased the goals on MSN and on Facebook and on social and on Skype and on Twitter. So we came out of the gates really fast saying, People need to know about these goals because if they don't know about these goals, they don't know to go to their governments and go to their organizations to say, hey, you signed up to this. And within Microsoft, we looked and said, how are we doing internally? So let's see across the board from our people, our products, our governance model, and where do we fit? Because we can't do anything unless we know inside our organization that we're doing okay. And then we're in the process now of where do we go from here? So there's a lot of opportunity, and this isn't something that we're gonna decide overnight of how to do this, but this is what we're, we're kind of working on. And as you've heard many times today, the big issue of data, um, and we're working closely with ODI and the Sustainable um, Development for Data organization on good versus bad data. 193 countries are gonna get over 800 indicators fairly soon that says, how are you measuring against these sustainable development goals? A lot of countries don't have the mechanisms to do that. A lot of countries don't have, a lot of governments don't have a data strategy. So I think we need to, and this is where Microsoft is, is focused from a policy perspective and a technology perspective to back up and say, let's start from the bare bones and how do we enable all these countries to make sure that they can measure their progress? And then we look at connectivity, and TV white spaces has been mentioned several times, but how do we get the next four billion people on the grid, but obviously with connectivity comes other issues. So we're working with regulations and regulators to make sure at a country level we can do the right thing by the people. Across worldwide public sector, which we've got education and government and health, we want to use this as a metric for Microsoft. So Lauren mentioned earlier, at, you know, technology companies and in private sector having measuring impact. And, and as I also mentioned, once you measure something, and Microsoft loves a scorecard, but if you look at Microsoft's mission, it's to empower every individual on the planet to do more. Well, if you change that and we kind of mesh that mission with the SDGs, we can come up with something that looks like Microsoft creates healthier, safer, more empowered citizens, governments, and people. And our goal right now is that if Satya calls anyone within Microsoft and says, how are we doing on our mission? We say, look at our SDG scorecard, and this is how we're doing it. So this is what we're working on. We're incredibly excited, and, and there's gonna take some, some time and governance models around this, but hopefully in the next few weeks you'll see a little bit more from us on that. Hi, um, I'm Charles, I'm with, uh, with Esri. If you don't know who Esri is, it's the largest geographic information system provider in the world. Um, uh, our vision is, to, is that uh, uh, the, the core of, of the future uh, resilience and um, um, sustainable, uh, having a sustainable world relies on geographic information. So, um, in that vision, you think about things like water scarcity, soil erosion, population dynamics, energy uh, dynamics, and the geographic understanding and underpinning uh, of the data that's, that's needed to understand that phenomena. Um, these are some of our core, core values um, in, in the vision of creating a, a more connected world in terms of 
geographic information. Um, we've we've been around 46 years. Uh, in that almost you know half a century, we've been engaged with the UN uh, throughout the duration of that time, pretty much. Um, in that process of the MDGs, we've seen a lot of different patterns of implementation using our, our, our technologies for statistics and geographic information. And so what we've been doing over some time now, before I joined Esri, um, um, is really trying to understand the business needs of the UN and the different sectors. Um, so for example, we've been closely working with uh, the UN Statistics Division and other divisions to really find out the capacity of specific countries in collecting uh, information. And that's critical because a lot of these sustainable development goals, the 169 targets, the endless amount of indicators and mind-boggling methods that will have to go into that exercise, um, require uh, or put a lot of pressure on statistics offices because they're going to be the ones that are going to be driving information up to the, the global organizations to, to uh, make decisions on um, disbursements. So the core of our technology is to really uh, help you guys and a lot of the other development organizations better target development interventions using geogra geography, using statistics, and, and improve operations on the ground. A lot of the work that we've been doing recently um, um, are things like contributing to, to the ICT playbook and, and reaching out to the development community to provide assistance um, to organizations through our nonprofit and global organizations program, but also very concretely through partnerships that we've set up within these agencies as well as in multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships that we're involved in, um, including um, NetHope overall. Um, so. Uh, w within those partnerships, we're offering the technology for, f uh, for free to the least developed countries to bring them up to speed uh, around um, the collection of data, business registries, censuses, surveys, those kinds of things, as well as um, um, engaging ESRI itself into the new activities that are going to be coming about um, uh, for the SDGs. So um, that's ESRI's position uh, currently. Uh, we see ourselves as a, as a, um, as a, uh, a kind of backbone to a lot of the government organizations that are going to be collecting information. Overall, a lot of, um, I would say probably about 90% of the statistics offices globally who are going to be reporting on the SDGs uh, use our technology for the uh, their exercises in, in field operations for these surveys and censuses, and we want to see, uh, we, we have been honored to be a part of the SDG process, and so in that, in that process, we've been able to embed um, um, those previous, uh, or uh, try to address previous challenges uh, that we've observed during the MDG support that we've given um, so from inception of the SDG. So we, when we start, we hit the ground running instead of playing catch up um, like we've done with the MDGs. Uh, very practically, you could see our technology used all over the place in, say, a given number of developing countries and statistics offices, but it's very uncoordinated and very piecemeal, and they harness about 2% of our, the use of our, 2% uh, of the, the capability of our technology. So what we want to do is, is really elevate these statistics offices, development organization, um, you guys, uh, to use our technology to, to collect better information, uh, faster, um, uh, um, and, and increase quality. Uh, and that's kind of the vision that we, and, this, and the, the pace of, of what we're involved in now. And we, we, we're really excited to be part of the inception process for the SDGs and, and excited about taking that forward um, through the different mechanisms that we're involved in. Yeah. Um, before we pass the microphone on to Jim, I have a question for you and, and, and Kate. Um, you talked a little bit about e the importance of partnerships, you know, we, and we talked about at the beginning how, you know, partnerships are really important. You talked about partnerships with the UN, you talked about partnerships with the um, development um, organizations and with governments. Can you give your perspective on whether it's going to change the way tech, you know, people in the business sector partner with each other? 
um, the use of the SDGs. Do you see that changing your, your, the strategy for your organization? Is that a fair question? Yeah, I, I'll just take a quick 10 second answer. So, okay. so my really excite, excitement around this is that we're working with partners that were once competitors. And, it's, and we're all coming to the table going, we need to get the job done. So it's really allowing us to move fast in terms of innovation. And that's the exciting part. And then that's really, you know, these panelists up here are extremely smart people. And, you know, they would be my first, respon my, my first responders if I had a choice uh, for some of the questions that I'm asked in the development community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely agree and echo that. And I think, you know, we're starting to almost overuse the term shared value partnership. And, and that's what it kind of comes down to is we all have to sit at the table wondering why why we're there and what we can offer. And we've been working across the UN system and other um, NGOs and IGOs for 12, 15 years and have had some really successful partnerships and those are changing and that's what's exciting as well. Where typically, as you can imagine, you show up to some UN organizations, they say, partner with me, that means you give me a million dollars. And now they're realizing, I do, if you give me a million dollars, we don't really know what to do with it. So you have the expertise and you know how to do this a little bit better than we do because you're the largest software company on the planet. So those are changing. I think mindsets are changing. So it's, it's, it isn't a very exciting time and it, it has to change for this to be successful. Thank you. Um, so now maybe Jim, you can give us your perspective. Uh, do I get the clicker? I'm gonna give you the clicker because I won't keep up with you otherwise. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Daniel. I'm, uh, I spent the first 20 years of my career uh, as, a, as a hardcore technologist, who moved into strategy, and then spent most of it as the CEO of technology companies. And for the last six and a half years, I've been um, the COO, and I'm not a CIO, of Oxfam America. So I'm gonna give you uh, um, a view from the middle. Jan Eglin really gave us a view from the top, but I have a unique view, I think. Um, and the SDGs are, are, are a mouthful. There's 17 of them. Um, it's funny because you know you're deep when you actually realize some of the logos are wrong, and I actually found it. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go through the lily pads very quick, and when you get done with the next three slides, you're gonna maybe think it's not about technology, it's probably about information, and it's about what you're gonna do with the information, how you're gonna point that's different, and you're gonna understand why the SDGs may actually be attainable, even though there's 17 of them, and I'll give you nine trillion reasons why. Oxfam focuses on the upper left, right? We focus on the injustice of poverty that often equates to hunger, and that's where our mission has been uh, since uh, our inception in the 1940s. Uh, somebody's moving me forward here, okay. Now, goal 10, I think, is very important right in the middle. This is inequality. This is the challenge of our time as framed by many people, including Pope Francis. Huh, this just keeps going on its own. Nice. Well, I'll just let it go forward. So goal 10 is in the middle. And uh, as you heard earlier today, uh, a multiplication factor is of 200 times richer at the top than the bottom, or as the Oxfam statistic says, approximately 80 people have half the wealth of the entire planet. Something's wrong with the clicker? Is something you continuing to go off? No, I didn't, but maybe it's going, okay. Um, we got pasted in. So now we have timing that I'll be fighting. So I'm gonna be focusing on number 16 and 17. Why those are important? Because that's where peace, justice, and governance, it used to say peace and justice, they added governance. That was a little typo I found. And why the partnership goals and why this whole conversation is so important. So as we look at this, we uh, tend to focus on the kinds of money that flow into our sector or usually called official development assistance or ODA. This is uh, over the last 10 years, you can see the money's gone up to approximately $150 billion a year. Let's squish that down, shall we? Because ODA is pretty darn small when you actually start looking at the other sources of money that flow into the countries where we work. These are monies that come from companies with direct, direct foreign investment, with banks, with multilaterals, and so if you start building the, the wedding cake, you suddenly realize, my goodness, there's 15 times more money than there is ODA. In fact, if you could tap that, boy, wouldn't that be a lot more achievable to go after the SDGs? But let's squish that down, and let's make that even smaller, and there's all of that combined 
So when you leave here today, you're going to understand that there's something called domestic resource mobilization. Your tax money at work, the emerging markets have an enormous shift going on right now. There was a wonky conference held with the UN in Addis this year. It's called the Financing for Development Conference. And for the first time, the major recipients of ODA said, we don't want your money. What we want is a catalytic change to take this money, $9 trillion, and tackle the SDGs. $9 trillion. It means that there is enough money to tackle the humongous changes implied by the 17 goals, but it's not going to come from anything like what we do today. And that means that we're going to have to focus the SDG playbook as technology for what type of information? Lauren, you wanted information, not technology. It's information that actually equates to power. So where's the money? Where's the money? Anybody know? Of the nine trillion, what was the biggest source? Taxes, governments, governments. How are we gonna hold governments accountable? How can governments be effective? Who holds the governments accountable? Other governments, active citizenry. So obviously social media will play a huge role, but there's a whole nother sector called ICT for accountability. It's a subset of the ICT for D. It's going to be big. Trust me on this. The next piece is the private sector has an interesting role to play in all of this. When it's held accountable, it has a very strong, it only represents uh, about two trillion of the nine trillion. It represents disproportionate effect on the behavior of governments. When you convince a large multinational corporation to change what it does, whether it's a Microsoft or it's an oil and gas company or it's a food company, to change their behaviors in the country, you can make a big change. But how you do that is a dramatic shift in how technology equates to what's happening in the world and how you story tell. So when I look at the SDG playbook, I think first about technology giving me information, but then I ask, where do I point it? So I'm saying you need to point it where the money is because the money equals power. There's vast inequality in the system, and that's what you want to do. And I want to just close with one interesting statistic. We recently analyzed all the growth in Africa, and Africa's been doing pretty well. Most people don't realize that the growth rate has been slightly over 5% in Africa uh, for the last, I think it's five or six years, could be 10 years, but it's over 5%. It's just that there's a little problem underneath the covers if you understand microeconomics. There's actually slightly more than that, 5.1% growth, 5.7% of illicit outflow of that value out of the countries and out of Africa, which has resulted in 50 million more people going into poverty in Africa. So when you saw that heat chart that Jan Eglin had with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, think of the money that is being grown in Africa that's not staying in Africa. If we could convince people to recycle that money, if we could figure out ways to take and turn both taxes and domestic production in, you will transform many of the goals that were listed on the 17. So that's just a different way of looking at it, and that's my um, view from the middle. So thank you. Hold on. I think we don't have any more slides. Okay, so that's a, a, a bit of an introduction. We wanted to give you an introduction to the playbook, tell you what it's um, you know, what it aspires um, um, to do. I wanted to hear from the point of view of different types of organizations, um, how, uh, how they view their work, you know, um, associated with the Sustainable Development Goals and how they view technology enabling um, 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 that work. Let's hear from the audience. Um, do you have particular questions of the panelists? Or are there particular points of view you want to put um, um, forward from where you sit? Carol, uh, fantastic job in leading this work. I, I know you interviewed quite a few people. Maybe you could tell us how many and from where, where they came from. But um, what were some of the surprises as you went through the, the interview process? Um, um, it was kind of interesting. We, we interviewed um, over 50 pe people. They were from a variety of, of organizations. They came from some of the um, INGOs. They came from different um, um, types of um, um, technology companies. 
um, um, some in other types of bu businesses. Um, um, we um, interviewed, you know, a government representative out of the developing, um, you know, out of the developing um, um, world. We had a lot of discussion with both the UN and the World Bank that do a lot of work with governments um, and um, um, could um, communicate some of the uh, uh, other points of view. There is, by the way, in the playbook, there's a list of contributors that you can take a look at. Um, but it was interesting as we went through the, the playbook, there are a couple different things that um, uh, surprised me. Um, one, one, one was, um, uh, um, one was the extent to which the organizations really understood um, um, ICT as, a, as a, a strategic enabler of what they're doing. I mean, if I go back like eight years in, in, in you know, eight or nine years in, in, in this sector, that seems to be a sea change where you get consistency across organizations and really believing that there is great power in 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 in, in, in technology to um, better the human um, um, condition to help better the human um, um, condition, um, so that kind of consensus um, surprised um, me. Um, um, there was an interesting um, bit of different points of views around what you should focus on in terms of technology. There were kind of two ends of the spectrum. There were people that. Um, 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 we're very focused on providing technology, which today, um, if you take um, um, the poorest of the poor people, um, there's a chance of having them access to in the near future, and they thought there should be focus there. Um, there were other people that said you can't afford to focus only there. You really need to look out at what is uh, what the trends are, what's changing, because in another few years, what's possible will be totally different than what's possible today. And, and so you kind of had both the two ends of the, 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 the spectrum from people that talked uh, about technology. So some people thought, for example, things like um, the, the Internet of Things, um, um, smart systems were things that would only really benefit, you know, um, developed uh, uh, economies um, or that 3D printing was really kind of out in, there on the edge and it would take, you know, and it wouldn't be of use for a long time. Um, um, but there were others that said that's going to move faster than you can imagine, and one of the things that um, the developing community can do is really now kind of influence the ecosystems that, that come up around those, um, influence the policies that get put in, in, in place so that as they, as they become affordable and accessible um, 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 to developing communities, we're, we're prepared. Um, um, to leverage their value to the, um, the fullest extent. Um, so those were some of the things that, that came up. It was a lot of fun to do and see, you know, um, really see what people were thinking of. I, you know, learned a lot of things which I thought were amazing. 3D printing, which I didn't know that much about, you know, I found out that the World Bank was contemplating the use of 3D printing in, in, in camps um, um, to provide more nutritious food. Um, by taking ingredients that you normally wouldn't think about eating, like algae, <laughs> combining them with more traditional um, ingredients so that the foods were acceptable to the people um, um, within in the camps as a way to really um, um, be able to provide the amount of food needed, you know, um, 3D printing, um, the first, um, you know, 3D printed pill has been approved by the um, Food and Drug Administration in the United States. So things like that surprised me, things I, 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 I had not heard of. And then I found out, you know, that 3D printing is really something that is well entrenched in the developing um, world for many years now, which I, I didn't realize as, as well. So there were kind of surprises like that as, 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 we went, uh, as we went along. But what impressed me was the rate of change, you know, that the rate at which technology is being changed, adapted, um, and, and the kind of innovations that are coming out, many of them from the developing communities themselves and the use of technology, how fast that's changing. Um, 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 the use of technology and development and the potential, you know, that it really has to deliver impact. There was a question, Greg, over here. We give you a dud, huh? So first, a reflection uh, um, kind of also based on Lauren's uh, 
discussion this morning, there still feels like a level of complexity, right, in, in, in all of these, and how do we get it to be simple so we can take it to scale, right? And then thinking, I thought, Jim, the, the graphic that you showed and, and Stephanie sitting next to me kind of reflected on this as well, you know, um, the role China plays, uh, especially where we are, and, and the absentia of China in these discussions as international NGOs. Who would like to take? Does anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> Where's our turn? You know, I'm, I'm struck by the absence of, uh, of China in many dimensions. Um, they're very active on the ground, right? So when you spend time in East Africa, <clears throat> the world looks to India and China. So China's there. They're inside the uh, foreign direct investment bucket, and they're very, very active. Um, I, I think we would have to come up with a whole new way of working with them. I know that uh, Oxfam China, uh, Oxfam Hong Kong, struggles with how to portray itself as a friendly actor in that picture. Um, I will also point out that uh, China and Russia are the two largest non-contributors to the Syria crisis in terms of uh, support for refugees, which is notable. Um, so in some ways, I see things like Russia as probably not helpful at all, and I see China as a giant question mark. By the way, China's not in that $9 trillion number, by the way, just so we're, we're clear. Those numbers are for the bottom, you know, 20-some-odd, whatever, that were covered in, in, in Addis. Who, and these are the organi these are countries you would expect, like, you know, Ethiopia and so forth, that are really coming up strongly. So, I, I don't know how we get to simplicity on the SDGs because we spent I don't know what three four years trying to negotiate them, and this is as simple as it got. Um, I do think though, and and I don't know if that we should. I mean, you know, maybe maybe seventeen is the right number, um, it, it, and it's certainly less than what we started with. Um, I think the question is, is the question around the measurement and evaluation to me gets to be, and what the, those indicators are, gets to be the really critical thing. 800 of them, it, we just might as well not start. It's not going to happen. You've got offices that don't have the resources, they don't have the money, they don't have the skills, they don't have the capabilities. You give them eight, they might, might take a shot at it. You give them 800, I, it's going on a shelf somewhere and, you know, they'll, it's just not going to happen. Um, but what, what I think the, the way that we need to approach that is, and the way that we need to advocate for approaching that is, um, what is the really critical thing that we think would tell us whether or not we're being successful? And I don't know that those things are the things that we always measure, right? Because we, and, and I mean, and certainly as a statistician, and I certainly remember from statistics, you know, we, we can pose those questions in ways that we get the answers that we want. It may not be the results that we want, but they are certainly they are certainly geared towards the questions that we want. A and and I, keep, there's, I keep coming back to the Rebecca Jacoby conversation, right? Why, 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 why? Why are we measuring 800 things? I am pretty sure that if you ask anybody in, the, in, in any country where they're measuring the SDGs, they would not need 800 data points to tell you whether or not their country is making progress against those things. It does help us provide more nuance, but I'm not sure that 800, and I don't know if the number 700 or 600 or 500, but I think we need to take a hard look at that. Um, and I do think we need, to, we, can, we need to keep going back and asking, what is it that we're really trying to get to? Um, and what is it that we think we might learn from those 800 things? Because quite frankly, with a slight disagreement, it might be 8,000, and it might be something completely different than we had ever thought would be the, the indicator that it turns out to be the thing that's actually really interesting. And, and I just don't know the answer to that, but I think we, I don't think that we can design the, um, the measurements by consensus. Um, and I think that we probably need to keep taking a look at it in terms of saying, how do we get to more clarity and more simplicity? Yeah. We just haven't done the work to get to simplicity. I, I, I do well, want to say one, one thing on simplic um, simplicity. And, and that is, it has not so much to do with the measure, but, but it has to do with the why in the playbook we, we chose to look across all those ICT solutions, and there's thousands of them out there, you know, um, and, and say, okay, what are the core building blocks you need to think about investing in? It, it was to try to get to that simplicity, because if as an organization you have a, a platform of different technologies that you've integrated together that's a starting point for each new endeavor you want to take in on, 
it, you cut the time. You know, you go to scale faster. You cut the time to do the kinds of um, you know customization you have to do for unique needs of a particular context you're going to work in. And so that was the hope in the playbook that we could say, well, today, looking at today, these are the things where you might want to focus um, 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 your efforts because if you if you start with the uh, hundreds of thousands of you know um, solutions that are out there, first of all, they they generally combine multiple technologies, you know, to produce a, a, a solution can get lost in the forest. So, you know, um, you know let's, let, let's try to look at the things that are probably the most important to think about investing in. Can I do a contrarian point of view for Lauren? Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know where the number 800 came from. Um, I know that there are 100 and something primary indicators under the 17. Um, yeah. The 800. Yeah, so I, I, I don't there's no country in the world that's going to try to implement them all equally. I think it's, I think we should look at it differently. For those of you who haven't wallowed in the SDGs, you know, it's actually a little more approachable than you think, okay? Just look through the top level of indicators at first, but then realize in each country context, they're not going to go after all 17. What they're going to do is they're going to develop a theory of change that you need to be attuned to which will go through a subset of three, four, or five. I chose five out of there, and I wanted to point out that we don't think you can solve poverty or hunger without dealing with inequality. And you can't get at the inequality if you don't understand where the money is. If you don't understand how to affect the money, and which equals power, you're dead. Like, you could never solve hunger by giving people food. That won't work. But we know food systems can deliver food, so how do we bend them? So I just would, I would, I would argue that for any given context, you might be looking at a smaller number of five or six major goals and, and 10 or 12 major indicators under some of those. And I'm always blown away by, the, by the, the government officials I meet with in many of these emerging markets where they have multiple PhDs who are very smart, very focused, and who are able to actually think through this. So I, I give you my two cents. And to add to that, one of the things that we're thinking about as well, and I, I totally agree that you, you can only – look at a subset per country and what's most important. And, and we look at how do we measure our progress in this as we're starting to, to work our way through it is it's going to be a country level and very individual per country. So the U.S. might, you know, they might look at two. Kenya might look at four or five. And we as a team every year have to do that kind of analysis every year to say where are our big focus areas based on where they need the most growth. Can I ask a question? In all of this discussion, one thing that I was going to ask is, are, is anybody looking at how we engage citizens? Is there a citizen engagement playbook that how they get involved to support these? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we, you draw a picture and you basically mm -hmm. say governments, private sector, and civil society, and you put citizenry in kind of in the middle, but they, their active citizenship can hold government accountable. Even with closing civil society, you have to know how to do it. That's probably the hardest thing that's going on right now. So it's probably at the heart of how, um, in, in particular, Oxfam, Amnesty, there's a whole bunch of us who are really, and, and I would almost argue many of us. I actually heard Andy say something very profound from Save when he said something about, you know, the children <clears throat> will increasingly be advocating for their own rights. So we can clearly see in our minds, that's not a, that's not a stretch, right? You give people social media tools and you point them at a government target. I don't know what happens when a prime minister's office or a governor or a teacher become bombarded by requests from the kids that they affect. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our partner, uh, the benefit of partnerships for us has been to engage civil society um, and those organizations. So for example, we're working with Civicus um, data kind who does some of that work um, and we're really relying on them to help us drive some of the th the solutions that we're going to bring to the table around that, that that effort so this is some of the these are some kind of concrete organizations on how we take that forward I would also urge everyone to actually you guys are the experts I don't think the SDGs uh, the indicators targets methods and uh, goals are going to be uh, very complex for you um, so I would urge you all to get involved um, within your own work and contribute to the discussion. The indicators, I thought, were 300, actually, but they're being decided. Um, and that's what I heard from statistics. But anyway, anyhow, uh, 
they uh, they won't be de they won't be decided until next March, and so there's still time to become you know be involved in the process. I mean, we have till next I believe March or mid next year before they're actually you know the indicators are decided. So uh, I, I think the panelists would agree that we should all get involved, and we need to give that the expertise that we have to. To, to these organizations so they can do uh, better work in determining those indicators and, and methods. And I would also stress that the methods you guys know well. So please get involved in the methods because those are really interesting um, from a general perspective, I think from ITC, ICT perspective as well. Did you wanna say something? Um, Taking my UN hat off here, because obviously um, these goals have now been agreed and they, they were agreed by the Open Working Group and the UN exists to serve its member states. So obviously whatever, the mem whatever direction the member states give us, um, which is quite a <laughs> process in itself, we will follow. Um, but I think one of the things that, that personally disappointed me when I saw these some of these goals may or may not be reconciled because <laughs> if you uh, feed everyone and there is no hunger in the world, the, the magic wand is waved, then that's fine, but there may well be no fish left either. Or um, the, the sustainable development, for me as an economist, personally speaking, there's still a bit of a um, following a capitalist model. Um, there is still a bit of a question mark over that because um, it is the capitalist model that has given us our d sort of Western definition of progress and development, and yet it is that model that has created the inequality. So um, it's still fairly unclear to me personally, as an economist with the limits of my ignorance, <laughs> uh, quite how you reconcile um, eliminating equality and reducing inequality um, with uh, feeding everyone with protecting and preserving um, biodiversity and the environment. Um, the UN has always been ambitious. A, a lot of, you know, many of these are sort of aspirational goals uh, that we try to achieve uh, with various degrees of, of realism. And, you know, that won't, definitely won't stop the UN and many, many dedicated personnel, many of whom put their lives <laughs> on the line uh, for what they believe. It won't stop them from trying, but some of these goals are, are um, you know, they should be sort of aspirational in nature and we very much hope they come true, but um, the question is how? It, it, it may think be um, that you need to think of it as a system. You know, so the goals are all different aspects of a system. And if you push one too far one direction, it could affect something else. So I think one of the ideas might be behind the goals is that you need to achieve balance. You can't do, you can't do, sorry. <laughs> Wrong kind of mic for me. Um, you, you can't, you know, you can't, you know, um, um, basically focus on one thing um, without seeing what effect it has on the other things. I think you're saying essentially the same thing. And then that may be why 17 could be a good thing, you know, because if you go too far in, in one direction, um, you 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 may disrupt the whole the whole system that tries to achieve that that ideal of a balance between you know our environment our um, um, our, our our social structures and and um, our economic structures. There are a couple questions, question. out in the audience. So. I just wanted to thank you so much for that last uh, very honest contribution uh, about the role of private sector organizations in reaching development goals because there's definitely, at the heart of that question, there's a paradox that we're struggling with in the humanitarian community as well. Which we're trying to work with companies um, to look at us as something other than customers. We're trying actually to encourage them to even look beyond the bottom billion as customers and to look at whole new ecosystems of products and services wherein their own role may be unclear. And I know many of you on the panel are probably wrestling with this same question, um, trying to encourage in-house people to look, think longer term, not uh, quarterly results on ROI and market share, but actually looking forward to, right, if we go in this long term, how can we look at this in a way that will not 
um, ask us to abandon our very role as a private sector for-profit company and yet at the same time be committed so, uh, to social change, which at the end of the day, as our friends from Oxfam have so well pointed out, is about transfer of wealth and power uh, at the end of the day if we want to have a truly equitable uh, view of human development. So I just wondering for, for the private sector colleagues in particular, how have you wrestled with this within your own organizations? What kind of conversations have you had that you've found most uh, interesting and uh, <laughs> thought-provoking? I have, I have yeah. a quick, quick answer. We're privately held. Yeah, <laughs> that's not fair. You haven't met our CIO. Um, it's it's a hard cultural change, and it takes people and leadership to understand this. And this is this is still new with us. We love scorecards, and one thing, and we have you know shareholders, and we've got money to make, and we've got you know Wall Street to to attend to, but. Um, one, we have a few people in our organization that are starting to, to say, if we do good, if we go with a noble purpose, this will come. And we need to create a, a couple use cases around this, and that's what we're doing, is looking at a couple examples so that we can build that momentum. But it's, it's not an easy thing, especially in this organization where we've got a lot of competition out there daily. So as a former for-profit person, uh, I just discovered I wasn't evil when I came to Oxfam, but the um, two things of note. One is um, Unilever recently did a study, and they, they discovered that because of how their changing workforce, with millennials in particular, are working, they're discovering that their double and triple bottom line initiatives are turning out to be far more profitable than they ever imagined. And then this other really wonky thing happened in the United States that very few people are talking about, and that is the IRS has recently declared that making a profit is not the sole purpose of fiduciary care. The fiduciary care could embrace taking care of others, taking care of the planet, taking, you know, and, and as a result, it's created this whole beginnings of a movement which might take a generation, but I believe that generation will occur when the current millennials uh, become the CEOs. So you can imagine if there's hope 20 years from now, you'll have organization after organization competing on values, competing on net benefit to the planet, not just to the shareholders, and shareholders snapping up the stocks because of their, you know, SDG-like rating. So that, that's a utopian view, I understand that, but it's not as far-fetched as we might have thought it was in 1980. Carol, I want, just want to remind you that uh, time flies when we're having fun, so we have five minutes left, probably room for two more questions. Okay. Um, Robert Mela from uh, Lingos. Um, Carol, I have actually a question uh, to you or to the whole group. When you were making the playbook, um, you know, the purpose is where investment should go to in ICT to uh, achieve the um, uh, SDGs. And I was wondering, did you also get a um, voice from, let's say, investors or people that could uh, invest into these uh, yeah. in ICTs from the South? Um, from the south. From the um, global south. Yeah. From the global south. Yeah. Um, um, quite frankly, I'd have to go back through the list. Um, we probably didn't have as wide a representation, um, you know, um, um, from the global south as we should. But, um, um, but if you uh, look at some of the voices we did get, um, there was a real um, focus on the fact that in order to do sustainable development, you really had to have a vibrant local economy, which means you have to pay attention to um, all of the mechanisms that you put in place to stimulate local innovation, you know, um, 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 local um, uh, uh, competition, um, that, um, that, 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 that was um, 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 critical. And that was one of the big messages that we did hear from the people that we did interview that came, you know, from the Global South. Any other questions? There is one right here. Uh, thank you to the panel for your comments, uh, particularly on uh, uh, community-based uh, conversations, information uh, methodology, basically, you know, behind this data. I think the challenge, uh, from my perspective, within the uh, NGO community is, in fact, the methodology that's going to be used to collect the data. Because, you know, let's be honest with uh, ourselves, about 80% of us use a non-indigenized methodology to our research and data collection. 
And so I think it is, it's interesting, and I'd appreciate your comments further on that about how do we indigenize our research and our data collection uh, to measure these goals wi within the SDGs. And that's a challenge basically to the entire humanitarian development relief yeah. community. So if I understand what you're saying is, um, how, how do you get the, 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 the people that are, that, that we as development organizations strive, you know, to serve? I mean, how do you get their voice in, into the process? Is that what you're, what well, you're so saying? How do we, how do we narrow that down? How do we yeah. What? Yeah. So I'll make a couple comments and then pass it on to anyone on the panel that wants to uh, talk. Technology really gives people a voice and it gives people um, um, within, you know, local communities and so forth a voice um, in the structures that influence them and so forth. So we see a real um, use of um, technology there. But again, as, as, uh, as I mentioned um, um, before, too, we believe one of the things um, in the use of technology, which technology can um, really enable is, um, you know, m more innovation, you know, coming um, um, from development. And in fact, you know, whether you're using a technology that was invented in the West, um, what you see is a lot of innovation in, 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 in um, um, the developing world um, um, around the use of that technology, using it in different ways, and you see a lot of new technologies emerging um, from the developing world. And I think that's, that's, that's really important. Um, if um, at, at least from the, the, the people that we interview for the playbook, that's a really important aspect of what you have to think about in the technology strategy. But let's see what other people have to say. Anybody else on that? Yeah. I would just add briefly, I think the way that the SDGs were created shows that we are caring about that. And it wasn't just the Western world that, that input into these. It was over 100 different countries and over 8.7 million citizens and youth. So I think, and yes, that's just a start, but I think the way that they were created means that we're understanding there's a lot more people that we're not listening to, and that's something we need to, to impact or use technology to, to impact. Carol, you uh, got a little bit of a late start, so I'm going to allow you to go a few minutes uh, over. I have a, a question myself. Uh, in the play, <laughs> <laughs> so there, see, <laughs> power of the microphone. So uh, in the uh, in the playbook, which I actually did read, at least I read an early draft of it. You may have changed it since then, but you had a lot of good examples uh, from the agricultural sector. Like we kind of went through the whole the whole playbook. Uh, so, question for you: Are you planning on extending this to other sectors over time? And a question to the panel: What sectors do you think would be the places to go next or first? Education, yeah. uh, health, whatever. Well, well, let me just say a little bit about the plans. Um, I think, just given the time frame, you know, we had the recommendation to take that example we did for agriculture. Agriculture looked at. The, all the stakeholders in, you know, in the agriculture, you know, sector, you know, starting with the farmers, um, you know, extension agents, um, government extension services, agro enterprises, you know, the, um, 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 the people that provide um, goods and services in, uh, in that area. And we kind of looked at their information needs and then the kinds of um, um, ICT solutions that were emerging um, 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 to meet those needs. So what we plan to do is run a, a blog series um, where we look at each of the additional sectors in the same way. So we go into education. I mean, in the playbook, there is an, ex there is an example for how technology is being in used in education. But what we want to do is, you know, look at, you know, the different major stakeholder groups in that sector and then, you know, what specifically are their major information needs and, and how technology might uh, address those. Um, but let's hear from the panel what they think we should focus on. Any, any farmers up there? No, we did, did, did that. Teachers? Doctors? Yes, more. <laughs> yeah, I'd vote for education. I mean, that's, a person, that's a personal feeling, but yeah, I'd vote for education. Yeah, I would, I would <laughs> si agree with that. I mean, we've seen them. There's a lot of examples out there on, on kind of accountability loops, getting back to uh, the citizen voice um, and other mechanisms um, for the effective use of ICT for education projects. Um, there's a lot of examples of that in the World Bank. Um, through some of their education projects and the, the use of ICT within 
those projects around you know, teacher absenteeism, um, um, participation, and other examples. Yeah, we, 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 I mean, obviously, I mentioned accountability. Uh, Neil McCarthy, wave your hand, Neil. We're really interested in ICT for accountability. We've been talking with Carol about whether this should be a major subtract at the ICT for D conference um, in Nairobi. Uh, Neil, um, Darius Teeter, who's not here, who wanted to be here, you know, went to Open Data Camp, and he came back and he said, you know, there's some things that will just blow your mind, right? So at an Open Data Camp, a group of Russians came to train others on how to do uh, really a good citizen journalism in closed civil space. What are the tools and techniques? How do you do it in a way that you can actually like, get positive reaction or at least some mo positive momentum and not just get cracked down, you're going to jail, or worse, you're going to get killed? So, I mean, it doesn't quite map to like just saying picking technology off the shelf. It's a fundamentally different way of thinking about how we're going to apply technology and information. And, and I keep using this word power. We know we talk about money, but it's all about power and changing power dynamics. And so we've got a lot of tools. And accountability, I think, is going to be the, the tool uh, that it's going to really pry open. It's a very, very long lever, and you can really lift a lot up with the, with the voices of a relatively small number of people. We saw that with behind the brands. We probably had, I can't remember the number, but 100,000 people took action. But we got the 10 largest food companies in the world to transform their behaviors on many different indicators. And we got win after win after win with Mars and Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Nestle. And we, we were like, this can't be happening. Like, how is this happening? Well, let's leverage, right? It's the leverage and power of the voice of people. C can, can I, I add well, to with add, that? Can I just add to that? Very quickly. Yeah, I'm very quickly. You guys off. The, the World Bank recently now has a uh, uh, stipulation in some of their projects where the accountability loop is actually embedded into the project uh, appraisal document. So you have to have that accountability loop for future projects coming out. And so I would you know, second that. It's just the getting the accountability within the, there isn't an accountability environment per se. You have to take a sec, uh, has to create it, yeah. And I, I think education might be a low hanging fruit there to do that. Okay, well with that, I think it's time for us to thank Carol and the panel. Thank you very much.